Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who teaches us, filtering out the ignorance and the foolishness that may be said, opening our hearts to the wonders of your grace so that the peace of God that passes understanding might grip our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As many of you know, we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Galatians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had essentially reached the end of chapter 4. So Galatians chapter 5, beginning chapter 5. Now this, of course, is the Holy Spirit's great work I'm talking about the epistle to the Galatians. His great work against law in the contrast of law and grace. And in our last several studies, we've been looking at the Holy Spirit's explanation of an allegory in the case of Abraham and his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, one born after the flesh and the other born after the spirit. Uh, we went through that allegory, and as we reach the end, nevertheless, what saith the Scriptures, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Now, I point out again that which uh, I believe most of you probably already know, that in Abraham's day, Moses had not yet written uh, the Pentateuch. And so we have what the Holy Spirit says, the Scriptures say, and what we are quoting, our conversation between Sarah and Abraham in casting out Hagar and her son because Sarah saw Ishmael despising or ridiculing Isaac. There was about a a 14-year difference in the children. From the human standpoint, you probably wouldn't have expected much different, but from God's standpoint, this was all planned. It was all planned by God that we, you and I, might have a marvelous lesson that there are children of the flesh and there are children of promise. And it would be a great mistake to miss that truth in what the Holy Spirit's doing here. He that was born of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. But as then, he which persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, so it is now. The flesh persecutes the Spirit. The flesh, dearly beloved, persecutes the spirit. Now, keep in mind, there's no chapter divisions in the original text. We're looking at chapter 5, verse 1. What you could say is that anyone, you could say that anyone who is legalistic is going to hell. I mean, you could say that, but I don't think that you could say that in the context of the passage. You know, it'd be terrible to think that everybody who, who taught that, you had to be water baptized in order to be redeemed, or you had to be circumcised in order to be redeemed, went to hell. Okay? I suggest to you, there is a possibility, which I believe fits the allegory, and that is that what we're looking at here are two men flesh and spirit, your old man and your new man. 
Okay? How did you get the flesh? The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, which... Uh, and we'll see them shortly in the fifth chapter. Where did all of that come from? Satan in the fall. The flesh is not going to be an heir with the Spirit. Folks, that is a marvelous, marvelous truth. What a tremendous load is lifted from the believer's shoulders when one comes to realize that it's the new creation that's redeemed, not the old. Much of modern Christianity, uh, at least in their focus, is trying to make the old man righteous. That it's the old man that's going to go to heaven. We just got to clean him up a little bit. Nevertheless, what saith the Scriptures? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman, that's flesh born after the flesh, shall not, absolutely not, it's, it's hume in the Greek, it's the absolute negative in the Greek. If we had a double negative in English, we, we make it a positive. But in the Greek, we simply emphasize it. The son of the bondwoman shall never, ever, 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 ever be heir with the son of the free woman. Now the trouble is, that's the English. But when I look at the Greek, though then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, you know, there are many areas of legalism and humanism, but we are children of the free, dearly beloved. One is articulated, the other is not. The Holy Spirit wants to emphasize, wants to push upon our minds that we are children of promise. Children of promise. And I venture to say that most of modern Christianity says that you're God's children because you decided to be. You know, how do, how do I become God's child? Well, you come down the aisle and you accept an, an evangelist's hand and uh, you profess Christ. That's modern Christianity. And folks, that is not biblical. You are children of promise. God promised you to Christ before this mess of a world began. Before He placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you were promised to Christ as a child of promise. However, you are now persecuted by Him that is born after the flesh. I'm going to suggest to you that's your flesh. Okay? I can read any number of commentaries on the end of Galatians chapter 4, and the persecution is, seems to always be somebody outside of you persecuting you. But it won't be long until we'll read that the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do the things that you would. That'll be in the fifth chapter. Dearly beloved, I believe that the persecution, the primary persecution in our present context is that conflict that exists in you between flesh and spirit. You can listen to a thousand sermons and you can read a thousand books where people are unwilling to take that last step that God actually did it. He did it all in Christ. You are not going to be an heir of the free woman because of anything that you did. Nothing. Nothing. That's the grand climax of this book. Not because you believe, not because you receive, not because you repent, not because you're baptized, not because you're a church member, not because you're a member of BHF. To follow that you follow BHF or anything else. No work of the flesh is of any merit with God. You are children of promise, and that which is of the flesh will be cast out. None of, none of it 
is part of the inheritance. That's the grand truth, dearly beloved. The result is we're not children of flesh. We're children of spirit. Now, it makes a big difference how we act. I've been saying that for uh, forever. In Romans chapter 9, those who were born after the flesh, these are not the sons of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. Who made the promise? Well, God did. And it is non-biblical to suggest that what God promised was that if you would believe, He would make you His son. That's humanism. That's saying that that flesh that cannot please God is not subject to the law of God and in fact is God's enemy. Flesh can do something that leads God to make you a new creation in Christ Jesus and all of the Word of God is mitigated against that. If you were my sheep, you would believe. It's the redeemed who believe. The redeemed who receive, why? Because they're children of promise. And since you're children of promise, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. <coughs> there are... Uh, all kinds of activities of the flesh, but there's only one promise. You and I were promised to Christ in the decrees of God. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Now, has He made you free or not? The word made free is an aorist active. He really did it, and he's not doing it over and over and over again. Please don't miss that part. By far and away, the modern thought is that, well, this is, this is a come and go thing. You know, sometimes you're free, and, you know, and sometimes you're not. And, and every time that you're not, well, you, you know, you got to be made free again. And, that would require Christ to die again. It won't be very long until we get to the ninth verse. And I already have the study on the ninth verse prepared. So I don't want, want to, I really don't want to tip my hand, but a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. If you, if you have to accept Jesus Christ, dearly beloved, in order to be redeemed, Let's look, at, let's look at that. I'm, I'm going to call that leaven. You know, if that's true, then the, uh, the old man has to be able to, to do something that pleases God. And since the Word says it can't, that means the Word isn't true. If you can do something to be redeemed, you can do something to, to be non-redeemed, which, you know would mean Christ has to die again, which again violates biblical truth. And all of the theology comes crashing down. It all collapses. You don't have any Bible. You don't have any canon of truth because one false doctrine des destroyed the entire lump. Stand fast. Well, we'll, we'll have a We'll have an argument when we get to the ninth verse, I'm sure. Uh, you know, when we're not in the ninth verse. I'm glad for that because somebody's gonna, somebody is going to point out, well, leaven doesn't mean that. We'll, we'll discuss that next month if we're here. Um, some of you know what I'm talking about. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Christ did it. He is the one that made you free. He's the one that made you righteous. And it's an aorist tense. He did it once. Okay? We are then given a present imperative, a command to stand in that liberty. It's a command. 
someone says, well, God doesn't change. And he, and he says that a woman shouldn't wear that which pertains to a man. You know, therefore, it's wrong for women to wear pants and, and you know, shaps and, you know, uh, uh, whatever else. Well, my first comment would be that most of the pants that I see women wear, I'd never wear in a thousand years. But that's, that's kind of beside the point. Then when somebody says that, you know, when somebody says that to me and I say, well, we're not under law, we're under grace, they say, well, God doesn't change. And if God didn't like pants in the Old Testament, well, then He doesn't like pants today. You know, and my answer is, you know, I believe God doesn't change, but, but did He like bacon in the Old Testament? <laughs> You know, if you make me subject to one part of law, you make me subject to all of it, all of the law, then I am commanded to stand firmly in the freedom. And what does freedom mean? What does liberty mean? Surely that word doesn't mean license to sin. Folks, your old man doesn't need that. It does fine without any help from any external source. Liberty can't possibly mean license and it doesn't sound very good. If I suggest to you that I think true liberty is the freedom to trust and believe God, to live like who you are, I think I'd be telling you the truth. Anything else is bondage. Bondage is sin. Sin is what holds you in bondage. Someone suggested, and it's not me, and I, and I, I can't, I, I probably shouldn't quote since I can't uh, give you the reference, but someone said that they thought that true liberty was that nobody was looking over your shoulder. I got somebody looking over my... my Some God isn't, you know, your sin and iniquity, your sin and iniquity will I remember no more. Okay? All right. Is what God said. Cast your sins as far as the east is from the west, buried in, I mean, in the depths of the sea. You're washed, you stand before him, white as snow, because why? Of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you're holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Why isn't that good enough? Why are there multiplied thousands and thousands of Christians who aren't satisfied with the fact that they're holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight? You know, I, I've got to do something to make myself acceptable to God. Forget the fact that we're told that we are, we've been accepted in the Beloved. You know, it even bothers modern preachers. It's just inconceivable that it could be that easy that Christ paid it all. Well, He did. One of the modern Bible teachers, you know, taught a book or wrote a book on, on easy believism. You know, that's wrong. It, is, it, it isn't easy believism. Folks, it's nothing. It isn't easy. It's nothing. Easy means that you could do it, but you don't, you don't, you don't have... You don't have to work very hard at it, you know. That's the wrong kind of believism. The reason believism is more than easy, it, it's zero. It, the reason for that is because you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you are His sheep, you will believe. You do believe. You do not become a believer by believing. And that's modern Christianity. If we could just get people to believe, they'd be believers. No, 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 no. That's backwards. If they're already believers, they'll believe. Stand firmly in that liberty. Modern Christianity doesn't stand in that liberty. You know, I would hate to think somebody thought that I was a Christian because of my works. I really would. It isn't what I do. I stand in the liberty of Christ. You are not under law. You are under grace. Well, shall we sin then that grace may abound? The Scriptures say, may it never be. 
I say to you, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. You know, and you look me in the eye and, and you tell me honestly, that's, that's what you want to do. And you know that you can't because of all that God has done for you in Christ. You can't do that. You want to live for Him. You want to do it based upon the pure principle of love. Not because you're earning heaven. And not because of any other reason. But because you love Him and you realize all that He's done for you in Christ Jesus. God gives us a command to stand firmly. It's not a, a, a verse that's hard to remember. Chapter 5.1 To stand firmly in the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free. So He's done it. Okay? Before we go on with this chapter, I want it clearly understood in our present study that it's based upon the solid foundation that He's done it. You have been made free, folks. Okay? Whether you act that way, live that way, or think that way, I, I don't care. I, as long as we realize the thing that underlies this, the present passage is that you have been set free because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Not because you believed. Not because you received. Not because you shook some evangelist's hand. You have been set free by Christ. You didn't find Him. Well, I found the Lord. No, He found you. Okay? In the 10th chapter of Hebrews, we're told that you were perfected forever by His one sacrifice. You can't argue with one sacrifice. And it seems strange to me that so many Christians can argue with the word forever. Really? If God Almighty looks me in the eye and says, I've been perfected forever, I'm sorry, I don't care what you say. All right? I believe Him. I know in my own life I don't act, think, or live perfected, but I am, and I'm going to stand in that freedom. It's a command. He did it. And it's a once-for-all transaction perfected forever. All right, I read 1 John, he, he that is born of the Spirit does not commit sin. And I, I just read an article by one of the nation's leading theologians. Now, you want to be careful with that word cannot. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that he cannot sin. It means that he cannot be continually in sin. Well, I am. Yeah, I, prob I probably shouldn't have told you that. Maybe now you'll get another pastor. But for those of you who are not always in sin, I, I mean, you have my greatest respect. I, I, and now I'll start worshiping you instead of God. No, it's the new man, folks, that can't sin. The old man is going to be cast out. I do the things I would not. And the things that I would not, well, these I do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God by means of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, isn't it wonderful that he didn't say, by means of my perseverance, my belief, my acceptance, my, my works. No, no. By means of Jesus Christ. And I have the promise of God that the old man will be cast out. It's, it's because of Satan that sin entered the world through Adam. And we now become people of flesh. But that wasn't born of God. That was born of sin. That's the bondwoman. It's sin. That's bondage. Not freedom. My God is God. And I was made free. The verse doesn't say I was... To, look, the verse doesn't say... Look at it. It doesn't say I was set free, but I was made to be free. 
Okay, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Why then should I become entangled again in the yoke of bondage? Well, suppose I do. Am I no longer made free? <laughs> Dearly beloved, I don't know how many people are God's people, but there's a great multitude of people that are headed for heaven for one reason only, and that is because they are God's children, and He redeemed them in Jesus Christ and set them free, made them righteous, new creations in, in Christ, and that new creation is bound for glory. They possess an inheritance. And the great bulk of, 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 of them in bondage. I, I, I can't take this passage to say that those who are entangled again in the yoke of bondage go to hell. Not at all. But I do believe that you, whoever you are, that you have a new that you have a new man and you have an old man and that you cannot do what you want, what you desire, what you will to do. That, that's why you're wretched. Here is a command. You, you'd think we'd be interested in God's commands. Here is a command not to be entangled again. The word is the normal Greek word for again. It says that they were entangled once. Every one of you, every one of you, are both flesh and spirit. The day of your deliverance, when you, when you came to understand that God had made you a new creation in Christ Jesus, deliverance is the term uh, salvation in the Word of God. I don't believe that the word salvation says that, that at that instant that you were redeemed, I've spoken a lot about the difference between redemption and salvation. You know, just let me give you, if you, if you don't follow this channel, let me give you a simple illustration, which I believe to be biblical. There was a fellow, this, this guy named Saul. He was on the road to Damascus to persecute those who professed to be new creations in Christ Jesus. Now, he was a new creation in Christ Jesus. All right promised to Christ before the foundation of the world, elected by God, chosen, made righteous, and He's going to kill God's people. Now I'm rattling the pulpit a little too much here. And on the road to Damascus, His eyes were opened and He recognized the bondage of sin. And the Holy Spirit uses His life to rejoice in the liberty and the freedom that He has in Christ. It was God who opened His eyes. I do not believe Paul was redeemed on the road to Damascus, but I do believe that Paul's eyes were open to the redemption that was, that, that was his in Christ, and he was delivered from the bondage of sin. And he is said to be an example to all who would thereafter believe that includes you and that includes me. But it would appear in Acts that, that he went back in bondage. You see then, you see then, brother Saul, how many brethren are zealous for the law. You know, and we ask you, don't hurt their feelings. And he went into the temple to make sacrifice, which... You know, well, which would have blasphemed the, the very liberty that he proclaimed. And God stopped it. I'm not, I'm not sure Paul didn't go back into bondage. It bothers me a bit. Folks, if Paul could, think how easily it would be for any one of us to conclude that in order to be saved, in order to be redeemed, in order to go to heaven, that we have to do something. And the biblical truth is, you don't do anything. It's not even easy, easy believism. It's nothing, folks. Jesus paid it all. Be not entangled. It's a, that's a present passive imperative. And I think that the passive voice indicates that 
If I am entangled, it's from the old creation, from the flesh. It's not me. I am not going to entangle myself. It's the flesh that's going to entangle me or the one born after the flesh, which I believe in the allegory to be our flesh. There was a time when I thought that, uh, you know, it was, uh, well, it was you doing it yeah, to me. You know, there was a time when I thought it was the one, the one who taught, taught legalism. You know, I believe more and more as I study this, this context, he that is born after the flesh is my old man, and he that is born after the spirit is my new creation, and there's me, and that if I am entangled, it's done by my old creation, not by me. That's why it's a passive voice. The verse is instructing us to actively stand fast. And that can only be done, folks, by the, the new man. The sinless new man. And if in fact that process is not happening in your life, then you by default become entangled again. So the passive would be that it's, it's simply the negative of the first imperative. Stand fast. To me, what, what, it, what that is saying, folks, is if we do not actively pursue the standing active voice, actively pursue the standing fast in the liberty that Christ has procured for us, then the default condition of the Christian is he becomes entangled. Okay? That's it. If you don't, if, if, you know, we are commanded to walk worthy of the calling wherewith we have been called. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I believe we're going home soon. Keep looking up and rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.